بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا My brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته And yet once again I sit here before you honored and pleasured in this wonderful country of yours which I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless and to only improve it and make it better. My brothers and sisters in Islam, I'd like to begin with a few verses from the Noble Qur'an. بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم آمن الرسول بما أنزل إليه من ربه والمؤمنون كل آمن بالله وملائكته وكتبه ورسله لا نفرق بين أحد من رسله وقالوا سمعنا وأطعنا غفرانك ربنا وإليك المصير ربنا لا تؤاخذنا إن نسينا أو أخطأنا ربنا ولا تحمل علينا إصرا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا طاقة لنا به واعف عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا أنت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم الكافرين Allah speaks the truth. Brothers and sisters in Islam, I start by saying إني أحبكم في الله I truly love you in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what greater love is there than when a person loves someone unconditionally only because he or she knows that those whom he loves are only because they believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whoever believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and loves Allah, how can anyone not love them? Those who are allies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how can you not be allies of them? So Alhamdulillah for the blessing of this beautiful deen which unites us no matter which background we come from or nationality, no matter what color we are. I come from a different background to yours. But if you keep tracing it, you will find that we actually all came from the exact same background. And that is Prophet Adam alayhi salam who came from Turab, who came from dust, from soil. We began from soil and we end up in the soil, the same way we began. This life is a test. It is a trial. And we are tried in our differences in nationalities, color and race. Everything in between is a trial, but the beginning and the end is the same. And then there is the day of judgment where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will then reckon us. Allah says in the Quran, وَإِمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَكُلُّ شَيْءٍ مُسْتَطَرْ Everything is written. And He also says in the Quran, On that day you will all be gathered and nothing will be hidden. That day is the day of reckoning. That is the day which we are preparing for. A man came to the Prophet ﷺ, this hadith is in Bukhari, 
And he asked him, Ya Rasulullah, Mata Sa'a? When is the last hour? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam replied so eloquently, Mada A'adatta Laha? What have you prepared for it? So he responded to his question with a question. When is the last hour? What have you prepared for it? The man went away and understood. The last hour, my brothers and sisters, does not only mean the end of the world. The man, when he was asking this question, he was asking about the end of the world. Ar Rasul Sallallahu then redirected his attention to what really counts and is important to him. And that is, don't ask about when the world ends. That's not your concern. What your concern is, when is your end? Not only that, you don't even know when your end is. But since you have to be concerned about your end, then my question is, what have you prepared for the day when your end is going to come, which you do not know when it's going to be? That is what matters. And everything else is insignificant. Let me explain why. Because, my brothers and sisters, as you all know, and let me reiterate this if you already know it, everything that we work for and build and accumulate in this life, we will, whether you like it or not, you are going to leave it behind by force. Ar Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or the scholars tell us that when a person goes to their grave, they take three things with them. And two of them return, one of them stays. Now, the lesson from this is true. It goes in line with the Quran and Sunnah. Usually, your family goes with you. Friends and family, they go to the grave to bury you with condolences and weeping for your loss. Your wealth may be seen also on the way. Or your wealth may stay not far away, your inheritance and your deeds, they go with you to the grave. As for your wealth, it stays behind and your family stays behind and your deeds stay with you. Who of us will go into the grave with their mother or father? We love them a lot. Who of you will go into the grave with their son or their daughter? or their brother or their sister, just for one night, one minute. None of us will do that, no matter how much you love them. Which of us can take any of their wealth with them? Even if it was you were buried with it, what are you going to do with it? But what you will take with you are your deeds. The good and the bad of the deeds. This is the reality. And I know that everyone knows this. We know it like the backs of our fingers or the, front, the backs of our hands. We know it better than what we know our name. Then why, the question is, why do we not work putting before our eyes in priority our preparation for that day when it comes? When I was in Melbourne, they brought in three people to the masjid. They made the news. Everybody's going to die. One of them was a doctor, the other one was an engineer, and the other one was also, I think, a doctor and engineer. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon their souls. This is the state of every people. Uh, one of their daughters fell into the river. They were on a holiday. And the father jumped in to save her. Then the uncle jumped in to save him. He couldn't, and then the son-in-law jumped in to save them, and all three died, including the girl. I thought to myself, subhanAllah, Islam does encourage education in every way. And a strong Muslim is better than a weak Muslim. However, what I got out of that, you just can't help but look and think, subhanAllah, all these years which we accumulated what we did in this world, on a journey, on a simple holiday, it can happen to any one of us. Fate was waiting, death was waiting right there. And now suddenly, 
They're in the masjid shrouded in this simple white cloth and they are about to be buried in their graves. And the family is wailing and crying over them. But what are tears going to do? Nothing can, nothing can do anything anymore. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does tell us in the Quran, أَيْنَمَا تَكُونُوا يَأْتِكُمُ الْمَوْتِ Wherever you are, death will come to you. وَلَوْ كُنْتُمْ فِي بُرُوجٍ مُشَيَّدَةٍ Even if you were within fortresses, high fortresses, death will come to you even if you are hiding behind there. Why am I saying this? Brothers and sisters in Islam, we all ask about what career we want to achieve. And we make that to seem like it is the biggest priority in our life. We ask about wealth and how much we accumulated and how much so and so accumulated. And we make that as though it is the priority in our life. We talk about estates and assets and how much we have accumulated of that and calculated so vigorously into detail as though this is the greatest priority in our life. In fact, some people they die, many people die and when they are dying, they bring their children or their family and among the bequests, the wills which they leave is look after the estate, look after the money, don't let uh, so-and-so take this, so-and-so. About money and world, still thinking about it, people are dying. We went to the grave one day and the Imam who was with us, one of my teachers, he says, I ask you a question, look at these graves. Do you think any one of them accomplished or finished what they did any of them finish what they had of goals in their life before they died? Not one of them finished what they wanted to do. Allah then took them away. So the Prophet ﷺ is saying to him, don't ask when the world's going to end, it's none of your concern. But the question you should be asking, the priority of your thinking should be, ماذا أعددت لها? What have you prepared for that time? What have you prepared for that time? Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahmatullahi alayhi he knew like all the other scholars and imams he knew what the priority in life is and he was one of those who chose to stay away from the distractions of the world in every way a true ascetic Imam Ahmad was when he was on his deathbed his son his son Abdullah entered, his second son, and he heard Imam Ahmad, his father, while he was unconscious in the intoxication of, his, of death, Sakarat al Maut, he was saying the following words La Bad, La Bad, which means not yet, not yet. Someone saying that at their deathbed gives you a very negative impression, doesn't it? Not yet, doesn't want to die yet. Doesn't want to meet Allah yet? So when the father came conscious again after a little while, his son asked him, Father, I heard you saying, not yet, not yet. Why were you saying that? I'm concerned. Imam Ahmad said to him, You know, son, that at the time of death, the shaitan comes to a person and never gives up, tries to whisper to you things. And in that unconscious state, just like you see the shaitan in your dreams, he still comes to you. He doesn't give up. He said, the shaitan came to me, my qareen, my qareen. You know, when you're born, everyone has a qareen, uh, a companion of the shaitan that stays with you, is the one that whispers to you until your death. The qareen, as Allah states it in the Quran. He said, my qareen came to me and he tried to trick me, deceive me. He said to me, لَقَدْ فَلِتَّ مِنِّي يَا أَحْمَدْ You have escaped me, Ahmed. You escaped my tricks, Ahmed. Like here you are now, you're dying. And I couldn't trick you or make you go astray. Imam Ahmad said, I understood what he's trying to do. He's trying to make me put my guards down to think that, yes, I've won the battle, but the battle has not over yet. He's trying to trick me. He can still get me before my soul comes out of my body. So I was saying to him, not yet, not yet. The battle between me and you is not over yet. Not yet, not yet, ya shaitan. Until my soul escapes, then I would have escaped you. So you will keep whispering until my soul comes out. So his priority 
was to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while his heart was still pure. Like Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he used to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh my Lord, save me on the day of judgment, the day when no one will be saved except he who finally approaches you بِقَلْبٍ salim with a heart that is, that is pure, with a heart that is clean and clear, with a heart that is full of tawheed. We ask Allah to make us among them. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam alayhi salam, Iblis, as you know, became jealous of Adam alayhi salam. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to Adam and the, to Iblis and the angels to prostrate themselves before Adam, Iblis refused. First it was jealousy. Then it became out of proudfulness or pridefulness. He disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the challenge became between him and Allah. Iblis said to Allah, my priority in life is to lead all the children of Adam astray. By your might and by your power, believing in God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I will lead them all astray. And I will come to them from every corner and every way. I will come to them from the front, from the back, from the sides. From above them and from beneath them, meaning from places where they can't even see me. That he's speaking metaphorically here. I will come to them in ways where they least expected me to come. I will approach them in every way I can to lead them astray. I, I promise you that, my Lord. Until you will not find most of them, Shakirin. You will find that most of them will be astray and not thanking you for this guidance. Allah said to him, then bring it on. In other words... Qala, he said to him, then go ahead. Fadhab, go ahead. It's like a person saying, bring it on. Go ahead. Faman tabi'aka minhum. Whoever follows you among them, then they will also meet the same fate you are meeting. All of them will enter hellfire. Nothing will happen to me. Go ahead. Then Allah said to him, and come to them through different ways. And Allah gave him ideas. He said, come to them through worldly adornments. And come to them with all your horses and all your soldiers and all your powers, you know, the shaitans, the powers and your soldiers. Come to them in every way. And associate with them, like live with them, with their wealth and with their children. Like come to them through their wealth. Make the wealth an alluring element and make their children alluring elements as well. Wa'idhum and give them false promises. Give them promises and give them warnings and give them threats. But all the threats and all the promises the shaitan gives you are nothing but deceit. Didn't you hear what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran? He says. الشيطان يعدكم الفقر ويأمركم بالفحشاء والمنكر. The shaytan will always make you afraid, warn you about poverty. And he commands you to do the wrong and to do the illicit or bad acts, illicitly bad acts. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises you forgiveness from him and the reward. So now the shaitan and iblis is on this road. His priority is to lead you astray. And the means by which he is using are all these adornments which are in life. He even said to him, لَأَقْعُدَنَّ لَهُمْ صِرَاطَكَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ I will sit awaiting on your straight path. See this deen that you are going to draw for them? Their salat, their zakat, their fasting, all of that. Their hijab. I'm going to sit awaiting for them on the deen. Meaning I'm going to go to the religious people and I'm going to deceive, to deceive them with their deen. To the last point, like this. If a person wakes up for tahajjud, for example. As if Iblis is saying this. If he wakes up for tahajjud, and we all know how much 
The reward of tahajjud or qiyam is yes. I can see faces here, mashallah. I can tell from their faces that you do tahajjud and qiyam here. We know the rewards of tahajjud and qiyam. I will come to them and say to them, pray tahajjud and qiyam. Pray it. Do it. And I will encourage them so much to do tahajjud and qiyam to the point where I will take them to, to, to absolute tiredness. So that there's only a small time between them and Fajr and I will say to them, give your body a rest, you've earned it and wake up for Fajr, you are a strong person. Then he will sleep and he'll be so tired to wake up for Fajr until the sun rises. And I will keep doing that so that they miss the Fard and they, and they get busied with the Sunnah. That's, that's how deceitful he will be. To make them busy away from the Fard until the Sunnah becomes more important to them. And today we know of people like that. The shaitan has got the better of us. You know, there's this joke one person said to me, he says there were two people. One of them is drinking alcohol. And then he saw a group of Muslims coming towards him. But these groups of Muslims were ignorant. And he said to his friend, quick, quick, put the alcohol bottle in your right hand. So he was drinking in his left. He forgot that the alcohol bottle itself is haram. But because there are ignorant people now, some Muslims, they focus on which hand he was drinking it in, rather than focusing on the alcohol itself. So the shaitan plays games on us, you see. He makes us busy with things that are less important, the sunnah or nafil, and he makes us forget the fard, for example. So the shaitan is on that road. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, even though Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to us in Hadith al-Qudsi, there is nothing that is more beloved to me than the things which I have made compulsory upon my servant. I love them the most. This hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. Brothers and sisters, therefore the challenge with Iblis is that. This is his priority. Which makes our priority what? Our priority is to not let Iblis or the Shaitan or our whims and desires take the better of us and take us away from Jannah, just like he deceived our father and mother Adam and Hawa. This is exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Surah Al-Baqarah. He says, O oh mankind, O oh my servants, do not let the shaitan deceive you away from Jannah as he took away your fathers out of Jannah. And what did he do with them? He made their focus change. From the focus which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warned them from. What was the focus? Let me remind you what it was. I know you know the story, but I want you to focus on something very important here. Maybe we haven't thought about it. Allah said to Adam and Hawa, He said, Eat and drink in Jannah and live comfortably. I'm come to a very important point. Don't come near this tree. Otherwise you will be among the oppressors. It wasn't, it wasn't any special tree. It was any tree. Hadihi. In Arabic it says Hadihi. This tree. Whatever tree. It doesn't matter what it was. Apple, orange, grape. It doesn't matter. We, in fact, it's, in the whole Sunnah we don't know what it was. In the Bible it says it was an apple, apple tree. But Allahu A'lam. But Allah says وَلَا تَقْرَبَ هَذِهِ الشَّجَرَةِ What tree it was in, is, is, is not of our concern. It's insignificant. The focus is not on the tree. The focus is on something else which is, number one, a battle between Allah, which is the right way and the nur, and evil, which is the shaitan and darkness. And it is also the human being in growing and the human being in becoming better and higher and more honorable to the point where he deserves to enter Jannah and deserves to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that was the battle. Don't come near this tree, you'll be among the oppressors. Who are you oppressing? You are oppressing yourselves. You are pressing yourselves by letting the evil take the better of yourselves and losing your focus from being honorable and pure. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to us, Allah wants to purify you. He knows better than us. So the shaitan, what did he do? He said to them, come here. Allah did not forbid you from this tree unless there is some secret about it that is good for you and he wants to hide it away from you. Obviously, Adam did not buy this. He kept saying, go away, go away. These whispers, he didn't accept them. But the shaitan kept going for decades and decades. And then he said to them, he only forbids you from it because you're going to become angels. 
You see, the shaitan knows that they won't believe that. But what he's trying to do is to make them lose the focus. Make them lose the focus until finally he told Hawa, you're going to be angels. It's the tree of eternity. Illa an takuna malakaini. Only that because if you eat from it, you're going to become angels. And so the focus changed. Hawa got deluded by Iblis. And her priority changed. Without even noticing. It changed to want something that was a deception. And that is either to become angels or something of eternal living or some secret which we just need to find out. See how the focus changed something insignificant. So then she convinced Adam and Adam listened and they both ate from the tree. And what happened is what happened after that. Both of them were blamed. After that Adam and Hawa never lost focus again. What did they do? Allah says in the Quran, فَتَلَقَّى آدَمُ مِنْ رَبِّهِ كَلِمَاتٍ فَتَابَ عَلَيْهِ إِنَّهُ هُوَ التَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ Adam had received some words. Allah doesn't tell us what these words are. However, he received some special words which he learned from Allah earlier and he said them by which he repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He turned back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah turned back to him. Allah is the one who loves to turn back to people and he is the most merciful. Who knows what the meaning of Tawbah is? Tawbah. Can anyone have a guess? Tawbah. Anyone? Have a guess. Yes, at the back. At the Sorry, I didn't. Sorry, brother. Forgiveness. Repentance. Does anyone know the literal meaning? Okay, let's say repentance. Does anyone know? Can anyone give me a different definition to the word repentance in English? Can you define repentance for me? Forgiveness. That's only part of it. That's part of it. The literal meaning of repentance or tawbah. Return. Jazakallah khair. Good. Very well done. At-tawbah means al-awdah, al-ruju' to return. So Allah says, Tubu ila Allah. Return back to Allah. Ila, to. Return back to Allah. Ayyuha al-mu'minuna la'allakum tuflihun. Return back to Allah, O you who believe in Him, so in the hope that you may reach success. Fataba alayh. Allah accepted his turning back to him, so Allah turned to him in response. That's what Tawbah means. Our priority in life is to always return back to Allah because our priority is to finally be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And our priority because of that should never let Iblis make us lose our focus. If we do, we do what Adam alayhi salam did and that is we return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seeking his forgiveness by doing that you have returned back. Let me give you an example. You've all been sons or daughters before. Imagine, imagine one day you went to your mother's purse or your father's wallet or wherever he keeps the money and without him or her knowing or without their permission, you stole some money. You stole, let's say, uh, 10,000 rupees. And you felt okay because no one knew. But then your mother or father found out. And they came to you very disappointed. And you started to shiver and you started to get nervous. And then you started to feel guilt and they put shame upon you. You stole, son. You took from, couldn't you have asked us? We would have given you. Why did you have? And then you go into this shame and this guilt and you begin to cry. And What is it that you fear the most right at that point? What is it that you fear the most right at that point? Can anyone tell me if you love your parents, what would you fear right at that point? You know what I would fear? Maybe you'll agree with me. I would fear losing two things, the trust that was between me and my parents and the love that my parents had towards me. I would start to fear that, losing their love. So I fear that. So then I made it my, my priority to earn their trust and earn their love back. So I seek their forgiveness. That's the first pathway to turn back to someone who you love. 
And this is another definition of taqwa, fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'll tell you this little story which I learned from my daughter. We learn from our children things that we forget when we become adults, wallahi. That in sometimes I look at my children and I think, did Allah make them like a, a teachers of us, some indirect teachers, educational institutions, our children? One day, I got angry with my daughter. She had done something wrong. So I pushed her away from me. And I frowned. I said, I don't want you to come near me. She was only two years old. So she started to cry. And she got afraid of her dad. Now when someone's afraid of someone, what does he do? He runs away. If you're afraid of a lion, you run away. You're afraid of a monster, run away. You're afraid of someone who makes you afraid. You run away. My daughter kept coming towards me. I'm pushing her and she insisting on coming towards me. And her eyes are afraid. Every time I push her, she's pulling. She's pushing, I'm, pu I'm, I'm pushing her away. Go to your mother, go to... No, won't go to her mother. Finally, I took her in. And I placed her on my lap. She held on to me. When she found that I had done that, her tears went away until she fell asleep in my arms. I said, Allahu Akbar. What just happened over here? How can someone be afraid from someone else and instead of running away from them, they ran to them? Then I understood one of the deep meanings of fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To fear Allah means to fear losing Him. So when you fear losing Him, what do you do? You run to Him. Allah says in the Quran, فَفِرُّوا إِلَى اللَّهِ إِنِّي لَكُمْ مِنْهُ نَذِيرٌ مُّبِينٌ One of the prophets said to his people, So run away, escape to Allah. I am to you from Him a warner. I'm warning you from Him, so escape to Him. Escape from Him and seek refuge in Him. This is our priority to always return back to our Lord no matter what happens and not let Iblis distract us because he will always try that. And every time we return, the shaitan begins to hit his head, especially on day of Arafah. You heard the hadith? When the people of Arafah are up there and they make dua for forgiveness, Allah forgives everything of the past and the shaitan begins to run around like a madman, like someone, like a dog following its tail. And he begins to grab so and throw it over his head as in the hadith, which is in Muslim. And he says, all my work in one day has been demolished. So then he starts again and again and again. And wallahi, he doesn't leave you until your soul reaches your gargling point. He will try to make you bow to him, worship him. And he won't just leave you making major sins. He'll keep going until you make absolute shirk to guarantee that you will stay in hellfire forever. Not just a little while. He doesn't even want that. Won't even settle for that. So the battle is on, my brothers and sisters. Understand that. And then once you understand that very clearly, your purpose of your creation very clearly, and you read about it more, and you research it more and ponder upon it more by visiting the graves, by listening to durus like this, by understanding, comprehending the Qur'an again and again and again and again, by asking many questions, by contemplating, by praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by returning back to Him in tawbah and feeling that guilt and feeling mercy and going through trials, then you will understand and be clear on what your priority should be in life. What is your priority, my dear brother or sister? What is your priority? I'm asking you this question, a question which I ask myself. A question which every one of us should ask themselves. Every day, every night. What is my priority in life? What do I put above everything else? Where everything else comes secondary or third or fourth or fifth. Now be careful. Be honest with yourself. Be honest with yourself. I don't want to know your answer. I don't want you to know my answer. In fact, I'm only concerned about myself. I'll be honest with you. On the day of judgment, I'm concerned about myself. And I'm not wrong to say that. And you are not wrong to say that. Because even the prophets and the messengers, who are we compared to them? On the day of judgment, will say, Nafsi, Nafsi. Myself, myself. Go to someone else. Until we reach Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who says, Ana laha, ana laha. I am the one for this, I am the one for this. However, who am I? I want nafsi nafsi on that day. But here I am working and telling you because I'm only wanting myself. So I'm helping you by helping myself. So brothers and sisters, help yourself. Ask this question. What is your priority in life? I can lie to you, I can lie to my father, I can lie to my mother, 
I can lie to my peers and I can lie to my Imam. In fact, there are a lot of people who wear many hats. Depends who they are around. When I'm in the masjid, I've got this hat. When I'm uh, at a wedding, I've got a different, no hats at all maybe. When I'm with my friends somewhere else who are not very religious, I've got a different hat. When I'm with my wife, a different hat. With my children, a different hat. With, when I'm overseas where no one knows me, I've got a different hat. What is your priority? What do you really prioritize? My brothers and sisters in Islam, be careful. The first thing is you have to be honest with yourself. Identify what you really prioritize. And then use as evidence your actions and your work during your life, during your day. Ask questions like this. If I say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Jannah, the deen, Islam is my priority, then ask yourself the following question. How much of the Quran do I read in a day? As opposed to listening to other things which are either neutral or displeasing to Allah. For example, if you listen to music, and I know many of you don't hear, but if you do, how much of music do you listen to as opposed to the things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves? Because, you know, I hear about some people who say, yeah, I listen to music, but I also listen to the Quran, as if, you know, they're balancing it out. If I pray my salat, when I do pray, how much of focus do I have in my salat as opposed to when I am working to earn a profit? How much do I calculate my focus in salat in that five or ten minutes as compared to that five or ten minutes when I am calculating a profit or a business trade? When I'm standing before, if I was called to court to stand before the judge and I stood before this judge on a crime which I have been allegedly framed for or I've been charged for, how serious will my focus be before then as opposed to how my focus is before my Lord? If my wife or my father or my mother found out something secret about me which I don't want anyone to know, especially them, how much of guilt or fear will I feel? How nervous will I feel as opposed to when I do something haram in secret and I know that Allah is watching me? What is my priority? Then it is estimated and judged by my reactions in life, by my actions in life in these different circumstances. Because my brothers and sisters, whatever is my priority, then my focus, my attention, my reaction to it will be more than anything else, generally speaking. Now, I know that there is people who, all of us, our Iman rises and falls. Sometimes we feel the reaction stronger than other times. That's fine. That's fine. But the difference between a person who prioritizes the hereafter to the person who prioritizes everything else in this world is the person who prioritizes, prioritizes the hereafter will always return. And when they return, they have a guilt. And when they repent, their Iman rises. But a person who prioritizes this world, they scarcely or rarely repent. They rarely make tawbah. They rarely return. And if they return, they're fake about it. Like a person who is a taxi driver, for example, or a person who is earning money from a haram source, and then he takes a little bit extra which he shouldn't earn, puts it in his pocket, and with the corner of his mouth says, Astaghfirullah. There was, uh, back in, I don't know, in Lebanon, they have this, this uh, trick, you know, in business. If, I come, if you come to buy from me, all right, and I want to charge you double. I look at you and I see you're a foreigner. So I say, oh, he's got money. I'm going to charge him triple. And then I see that you're a Muslim, a religious person. So I use the deen against you. And I want to say, wallahi, wallahi, it cost me this much. Wallahi, it cost me $50. And I'm asking you for 40 So I say, how can you say wallahi? You know what I found out? They said, we don't really say wallahi, we say mwallahi, mwallahi, which has no meaning. 
Or some of them say, Wallahi, and then beneath their breath they say, uh, Wallahi, it didn't cost me that much. <laughs> oh, Wallahi, it didn't cost me that much. So you, you barely hear those other words, right? And they think that, what's going on? This person is saying, Wallahi, cost me, I should believe him. Allahu Akbar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran about this major sin. There are people who take Allah's name in vain. Who take Allah's name in vain and take the deen in vain. Why? So they can get a little bit out of this world. Rasul tells us in another hadith where he says that there will come a time where people will be in so much loss. They will wake up believers and go to sleep in the evening disbelievers. Or they will be in the morning, they will be at night believers and wake up in the morning disbelievers. They would have sold their hereafter for a few pennies from this world. A time of confusion, a time of great materialism. I sold, uh, sell my hereafter for a little bit of pennies from this world. What are my priorities? Your priority. When it's time for work and it is time for salah. And salah time has this much time. And I know that I, can't, I can take time off to have a cigarette. I can take time off to go to the toilet. I can even take time off to make a phone call. But when it comes to salat, I will delay it and delay it and delay it even past this time. Wallahi, I heard, I once met a brother back in Melbourne and he said to me, he said, I said to him, brother, inshallah, I'll see you in Jummah. Which uh, masjid do you go to? He said, I don't go pray Jummah. I asked him why. He said, well, because I'm working. I said, but Akhi, you should try your best to try and take time off for that work, even if it means to sacrifice a bit of your salary. He said, yes, I know, but uh, doesn't Islam say that you should look after your family? I said, yes, but not on the expense of your salah. Because the whole idea of obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the whole idea that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created in this world is to, in order to worship Him. And by providing for your family is only because you worship Him. So if you left that worship out, what are you doing? What are you providing your family for? On the expense of leaving your Lord? On the expense of neglecting Allah's rights? No. It's like a person who runs to save an animal when their brother or sister or a human being is dying and they should save them instead. One of the two. But this person says, doesn't Islam say that I have to provide for my family? He said, it's not an expense of your deen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Ya ayyuha al-lazina amanu, Iza nudiya lissalati min yawmi al-jumu'ati, Fas'aw ila dhikri Allah, Fas'aw ila dhikri Allah, Wadharu al-bay'a. O oh, you who believe, when it is called, for the call of Jumu'ah, of the prayer, for the prayer on the day of Jumu'ah, then go to it and leave business and trade, leave business and trade. And, and then in the uh, other part of the verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِذَا قُضِيَتِ الصَّلَاةِ When the salat is over, فَسْعَوْ Then go back into the world, وَابْتَغُوا مِنْ فَضْلِ اللَّهِ And get from whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you of provision. So the priority is our worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Allah says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have not created the jinn or the human being for any other purpose except to worship me. Except to worship me. So what we need to know is why are we here? We are here to worship Allah. We are not here to uh, ask questions that our mind is not fit to understand such as what does Allah look like or the things about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself which are none of our concern. Your concern right now is that you've got a short time to live. 50 years, 60 years, 10 years, 20, Allahu alam. But you have this time to live. What are you going to do with that time? Because the clock is ticking. The clock is ticking. If you were deprived of food and you were starving for three or four or five days, 
What would be the only thing on your mind? Food. If you were deprived of water for two days, what would be the only thing on your mind? Water. طيب. If you were deprived of food and water and the only thing on your mind is water and food, next, what if in that time you were deprived of oxygen? You couldn't breathe. You couldn't breathe for five seconds. What would be the only thing on your mind then? To breathe. Will you think of the water and food anymore? You think of breathing. That will becomes your priority. Our salat, our worship, all of that is like that analogy. Everything becomes secondary until the worship becomes your food and your drink. You know, there's a saying from the scholars which I read once, a good analogy. They said the Sahabas, they used to place the deen like a crown on their head and the world was in their hands. So that when the crown went out of place, they put the, what was in their hands on the floor and fixed their crown. So they put the dunya on the floor and fixed their deen. Today, today the priorities have reversed. The crown is the dunya and what's in your hand is the deen. When the dunya goes out of place, we put the deen aside, we fix our dunya, then we get our deen. It's secondary, secondary. And the world of secularism today has succeeded in entering the minds of youth and the Muslim youth are also attracted by this. To make us seemingly or make us uh, believe that deen is only inside the home, only inside the temples. As for politics, as for social life, as for the outside world, it has no business. No business in anything. Deen is for yourself and everything else. Deen has nothing to do with it. So the priority in our life, what is it really? When people look at me, what is the first thing that I am thinking about? Do I worry about their perception of me? Or do I worry about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants of me? Do I worry about pleasing people? Do I worry about pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Even if I am a religious person, when I come to make salat, or read my Quran, or wear an Islamic attire, am I doing it for Allah or am I doing it for the people? What is my priority in this case? When I'm doing a business deal with you, what is my priority? To rip you off and get as much money as I can? Or for me as a customer to try and make your product look so insignificant that I convince you it's worth nothing and so I rip you off? Either way. And some people even use the deen to blackmail other Muslims. They come up and they say, I am your brother. You should love for your brother what you love for yourself. So give me a cheaper price. Subhanallah, were this the Sahabas? The Sahabas, if they bought something of another person and then they went and found out that what they bought is valued more than what they gave, they would come back and give more. And then the person who sold it will say, No, I sold it to you for this price, you take it for that price, good on you. And they begin to fight and conflict. The seller is saying, I gave it to you for a cheaper price and the buyer is saying no you deserve more today is the complete opposite why because their priority is jannah allah says he's talking about the muhajirin and the ansar when the muhajirin went to the ansar in medina the people of medina they came out while they were in poverty while they were poor themselves while they were more in need and they gave from what they have of little to the muhajirin who came and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they gave from what they have while they were more in need of what they gave away to them now they're the ideal role models for us. Let's get halfway there. What is your priority in life, my dear brother and sister in Islam? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lets you choose. He does not interfere with your choices whatsoever. He looks at you and says, I've given you the guidance. Now you accept it or reject it. I have given you freedom. I have given you free will. This is how I have honored you. Accept it or reject it. This is why some people, a person, a young person came up to me and said, 
brother, why, why do non-Muslims, I see them more richer and wealthier than the Muslims, even though we, Islam tells us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he doesn't like those who, dis who disbelieve in him. Yet I see a lot of Muslims are in poverty in the world. I ask them, and what makes you think that just because they're wealthy and full of, and the Muslims are so-called in poverty, what makes you think that they are better off than you, or that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has favored them upon you? Did you not hear that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, bismillahi ar-rahman ar-rahim, مَنْ كَانَ يُرِيدُ الْعَاجِلَ تَعَجَّلْنَا لَهُ فِيهَا مَا نَشَاءُ لِمَنْ نُرِيدُ Whoever wants this world, this عَاجِلَ, this quick world, it's very quick. Before you know it, it's gone. عَجَّلْنَا لَهُ فِيهَا We will quicken his provision. I will give him everything. What this means is a very dangerous word. We will quicken in our provision to him, meaning whatever he had in the hereafter, we're going to cancel it out and we're going to uh, bring it forward and give him the equivalent of that, but in dunya currency. In dunya. You want the dunya? We'll give you it. Okay, well, you don't want the hereafter, then we'll give you from the dunya instead. It's like a person is sitting there and thinking, I know there's a million dollars waiting for me. But man, I, I, want, I want money now, 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 now. They say, listen, you either take 10 bucks now or take the million dollars and you wait about five years. And you say to yourself, no, I'll take the $10 now. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, bow, they, they sell the hereafter with a few pennies of this world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, عَجَّلْنَا لَهُ فِيهَا مَا نَشَاءَ As much as we... ثُمَّ جَعَلْنَا لَهُ جَهَنَّمَ يَصْلَاهَا مَذْمُومًا مَدْحُورًا But then in the end, we make Jahannam what is left over. What else has he got? Yaslaha madhmum and madhura. He will sit in there imprisoned, madhmum, humiliated, madhur, regretting. But what will happen? He cannot return. وَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْآخِرَةَ وَسَعَى لَهَا سَعْيَهَا وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ فَأُولَٰئِكَ كَانَ سَعْيُهُمْ مَشْكُورًا But whoever wants the hereafter, we will give it to them. But he has to strive for it. وَسَعَى لَهَا سَعْيَهَا then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them, after they strive for it, an abundance in his generosity, like a person thanking you. Like a person thanking you. So don't be deceived by this or that. The greatest richness and wealth is in here. It's in here, ya akhwan. Umar radiallahu anhu once entered the house of the Prophet sallallahu one day. A Rasul sallallahu heard a knock. Man, who is it? He said, Umar. He said, enter ya Umar. Umar entered with a smile on his face. Who would not be entering the house of the Prophet He sat. Suddenly, after about a few moments, Umar began, began to cry. Al Rasul Sallallahu asked him, Ma yubkika ya Umar? What is making you cry, ya Umar? He said, Ya Rasulullah, I looked inside your house and I saw a small room. On the corner there, there is a bunch, a little uh, bundle of coarse wheat, unsheathed. And over there on your little window, I see a lantern with no fuel inside of it to light up for light. I looked at your mattress and it is one layer of straw. By God, I can still see the marks on your sides and on your blessed cheek and I looked at your pillow and it is full of coarse material rough Ya Rasulullah you are in poverty yourself and you are the messenger of Allah the best of all creation Al Rasul he felt sorry for him Al Rasul sallam, looked at Umar radiallahu anhu and said but Ya Umar have you forgotten Ala yurdika and Umar al by the way, he said to him, this is what he said to him, and the emperor of Byzantine, and the king of Persia, 
are reclining on beds of silk eating from the most exquisite meals with guards and servants left, right and center and you, Ya Rasulullah, bihada, in this state? Who are they to you and you are in this state? Then Rasul Sallallahu said, But Ya Umar, Ala yurdika anna lahum dunya walana al-akhirah. Does it not satisfy you that they only have this dunya and they're going to leave it anyway? And we have the akhirah and it is eternal. That's when Umar radiallahu anhu wiped his tears and said, Bala yurdini. Yes, it does satisfy me. It satisfies me. So what are we working for? Something that is temporary or something that is everlasting. Allah says, Minkum may yuridu dunya wa minkum may yuridu al-akhirah. Some of you want this dunya and some of you want the akhirah. My brothers and sisters in Islam, did you know that everything that you do in life, you can transform it into worship? For example, if you get to, went to the toilet, a toilet to serve nature, then you can turn going to the toilet into worship. How? By fulfilling the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam in the manner that he guided us with in entering the toilet and in exiting the toilet and what to say when we enter, what to say what we exit, you have turned the call of nature, which everybody does, into worship. Into like, like a salat in a different form. By entering with your left foot, because Prophet ﷺ said so. By saying, A'udhu Billahi min al khubuthi wal khaba'ith. By exiting with your right foot. And by saying, Alhamdulillah ladhi adhaba anni al adha o ghufranak. By not speaking inside the toilet, because that's the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then, you have turned a mere call to nature into worship. You have earned the rewards for it. By getting married, Ar Rasul Sallallahu said once to his companions, never take for granted any single tiny act of sadaqah of a form of good deed. Sadaqah means charity or it also means a good deed. And in every part of your body there is a sadaqah in your hands, in your, in your mouth, in your elbows, in your feet, every part of it, you can perform a sadaqah and try to use it in any way. He said, وَإِنَّ فِي بُطِعَ أَحَدِكُمْ sadaqa," And even in your intimacy with your wife is a sadaqah. It's a good deed. Then they said, Ya Rasulullah, Intimacy with our spouses is a sadaqah while we are enjoying it and fulfilling our temptations and desires. Ar Rasul Sallallahu said, Well, what would happen if you had used that temptation in haram? Would you not earn the sin? They said, Yes. He said, For choosing to use this temptation in the way that Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala is pleased with, Allah will reward you for it. So, my dear brothers and sisters, choosing your priority being the hereafter is not very difficult at all. In fact, you can still enjoy the luxuries, you can still enjoy yourself in every way which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed, except for the haram things. Make your priority that. Imam Abu Hanifa, rahmatullahi alayhi, another man of great priority of the hereafter. The way he taught us, he was a man of wara, meaning he left the halal things, the halal things, fearing that they will lead to haram. There are certain halal things that Allah allowed, but sometimes they may lead you to haram in the future, just fearing it. So once he saw, he used to sell material, and he used to make a time for the women to come and buy and sell, buy the material, and he used to examine it. So he had a special place where the women sat. One day, a young woman came and sat examining material. Then she left. Then a young man came and sat where she, where she was sitting, just casually. Imam Abu Hanifa came up to this man and said to him, Qum min makanik. You have to get off that seat. He said, Why, ya Imam, a halal am haram? Is it halal or is it haram? Imam Abu Hanifa said, You are not permitted to sit in that place until the effect of the warmth, the warmth of the lady who was sitting here has cooled down. You can still feel the warmth when she was sitting. So come back when the warmth is gone. Wara. Or like Umar radiallahu anhu, when he heard about Hudayf ibn al-Yaman, you know Hudayf ibn al-Yaman, Kati Musir al-Nabi sallallahu the one who kept the secrets of Prophet about the Munafiqeen for a little while. He 
married a Jewish woman at the time of Umar Dalano, he was the Amir al Mu'minin, Khalifa. Amir al Mu'minin found out. So he sent a letter to Hudayfa saying to him, Ya Hudayfa, when this letter reaches you, I command you to divorce this Jewish woman. Hudayfa came to Amir al Mu'minin and asked him, Ya Amir al Mu'minin, a halal am haram? Is this halal or is it haram? He said, no, it is halal, Allah tells us in the Qur'an, that you're allowed to marry from the kitabiyat, from the people of the book, the women of the people of the book, the chaste ones. But, ya Hudayfa, anta qudwa, you are a role model. And what I fear, and he also said to him, fi nisa'il a'ajimi khalaba, and in the women of these foreigners, there is a form of attractiveness, meaning they don't go out wearing their hijab in the form that the women wear it, our Muslim women. So they tend to loosen their hijab, attracting the attention of the men generally. And I fear that in the future, putting these two together, and you are a role model, I fear that in the future our Muslim men will turn their attention away from our pure, righteous, God-fearing women who guard their chastity in every way and turn their attention to these foreign women, begin to marry them and leave our women aside. So Hudayf ibn al-Yaman immediately divorced the Jewish woman even though Allah had allowed him to do so, fearing of this consequence which made sense. What is his priority? His priority is not his nafs or his desires. His priority is the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even if it means something halal out of fear of something developing haram later on. The tabi'een, the tabi'een, meaning the ones who existed at the time, the generation after the Sahabas. The Sahabas used to say to the tabi'een, you do things that are halal. You do things that are halal, but we left nine-tenths of them fearing that it may make us fall into haram. And they say, you do things that are minor sins. In our time, we looked at them as major. What is the priority? The priority, again, to move away as far distance as we can from all the tricks of the shaitan so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can be pleased with us in every way. My brothers and sisters in Islam, since our priority is the meeting of Allah and our priority should be in all our life, in all our actions, a proof of us returning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from our cradle to our grave, then I give you a short story Insha'Allah for the time that is remaining, giving you an example of how in our worldly life, in this modern day, our priorities should be reversed from what we are walking through at the moment. And in this story, I think you may have heard it in Ahmed the Repentant, we, say, we call it. In this story, you will understand that when a person turns away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or is tried with something, whether it is of hardship, whether it is of sin sometimes, whether it is of depletion of wealth, no matter what it is, you will understand that the priority is to return back to Allah and you understand the value of it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, as a matter of fact, the true believers are the ones who when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioned to them and they remember him, their hearts begin to move, begin to move. And when his verses are recited upon them, you find that their iman rises even more than before and upon their Lord they rely. This is the state of people who when their priority is pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when they fall into sin or they neglect their duties with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when they remember Allah or remember His ayat, the effect of it, if you want to know if your priority is really Allah, when you fall like this, you will find that the effect of it is in your heart. The proof of it is in your heart. The proof of it is in your iman. You find that your iman rises. You find that your heart begins to regret. Allah says, I swear by the day of judgment. And I swear by the nafs, by the person that regrets that turns back on itself and says, why, why, why did I do this? Meaning of sins. This is the true proof and evidence of a person who truly prioritizes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That when you fall, 
you miss your Lord. When you sin, you want to return back to your Lord. And suddenly, your life begins to change. In this story, which I heard when I was only about 15 years old, from a sheikh who lives in Riyadh, a favorite khatib of mine by the name of Sheikh Sa'ad al Buraik. This story did not happen with him. He, I just heard this khutbah from him in Arabic. And after that, I met some mashayikh who were from Riyadh and from Medina, and I asked them about this story, and they gave me some extra information, and now I present it to you. This story is a true story. And before I tell you, the shaitan may come to you to say, he's only making it up in order to move our hearts with some false information and a false story. But I say to you by Allah, as Allah is my witness, I have heard it from many shaykhs. And number two, they all swear that this is a true story. For wallahi, this is a real event. It is about a man whom we call Ahmed, although his real name is not Ahmed, because he promised, his friend promised that he will never identify him. But it happened with a different sheikh. His name was Sheikh Ahmed al tawil I think. This particular sheikh, and you could see on his appearance that he is a sheikh, he lives in Riyadh. He tells us this story and he says, now I'm going to act like I'm him, yes? So don't think it's me. I'm going to talk on his behalf. He says, I am a businessman as I am also a sheikh, an imam. On one of my business trips, I went to one of the neighboring countries close to Riyadh, close to Saudi Arabia. And from my information, I think it was Al Bahrain. Wallahu alam. He said, I went to one of the neighboring countries only to do a business which only took me a day and a night. And my flight was going to leave the next day. But when I reached there, to the place when I had, where I had to fulfill my business, I found so much corruption everywhere I went. I looked right, there was corruption. I looked left, there were temptations. I looked in front of me, casinos. Behind me, women of all sorts dressed in the most inappropriate manner. That way, Muslims drinking, Muslims drinking and spending their time in haram. billah. Everywhere, my ears hearing haram, my eyes seeing haram. I didn't know what to do. It was like I was in a stranger land because the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did say, did say, kum fid dunya ka'annaka gharib. Be in this world as if you are a stranger. Fatuba lil ghuraba. Glad tidings to those who feel like strangers in this world. And these are the believers. He says, I finished from my business and I just wanted to get out of there. But I was so tired and I needed a place to sleep. So I went to look for a place to sleep. And every hotel I entered, full of corruption, full of women dancing, full of men drinking and women, full of this, full of that, from hotel to hotel, until finally I reached one of the most, you know, at least the most decent of them all. But even there, there was full of haram. And a man who was a Muslim there, who had some atoms worth of iman in his heart, he came to the door and said to me, Ya Shaykh, please do not enter this place. This is not a place for you. You know, it's bad for us to be there, but I refuse to have an, the honor of our emblem or the emblem of our honor, this Shaykh, to come into here. The Shaykh says, where am I supposed to go? And the night is coming and I am tired. He said, I don't know. The Shaykh says, so I had no opportunity except to go to a nearby park and sleep on a bench. I slept that night until close to Fajr time. Then I woke up and I remembered that there is a prayer room inside every airport. So I went to the airport which was close by, and I prayed my Fajr prayer in there. I went back to sleep because I was so tired. And then, probably about two hours into my sleep, I woke up to a sound. In front of me, I saw a young man, not more than 30 years old, above 20 years old, somewhere in between. And he was praying and crying so badly like a mother who had lost her child. I didn't give or take. I have seen many of people who were praying and crying like that before. So I went back to sleep because I'm concerned about my flight and my tiredness. I need to get back home, you know, with some energy. He says, close to about Dhuhr time, someone was woke me up. I looked in front of me and I saw the same young man who was praying earlier. His eyes were red. His face was pale. He had bags under his eyes. He looked like a person who had not been drinking or eating for days. And he was saying to me like a madman, are you actually able to sleep? Are you actually able to sleep? Are you actually able to sleep? I said, yes, because I'm tired. It's natural. 
He said to me, as for I, I haven't been able for three days and three nights to sleep, nor to eat, nor even enjoy any drink. Oh, I wish they would have taken my money. Oh, I wish they would have taken my money. The Shaykh says, Subhanallah, take, calm down, calm down. Let us pray the dhuhr and then we will sit down together and you can tell me your story. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the guardian of our affairs. He said, him and I, who were the only ones in the airport, in the prayer room, we prayed the dhuhr and we sat down together. I listened to him and he said to me, I am a young man who comes from a line of princes in the city of Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. The same place where this sheikh comes from. He said, I come from, he said, I came from a place where all the wealth, all, all, all the exquisite meals, the best of palaces, the best of beds, the best of cars are beneath our disposal. Everything I ever want and I wish for, it comes to me. We have servants, we have wealth coming from every corner of our home, every corner of our lands. He said, but I got bored of this routine of wealth and servants and this and that. And I wanted to try something new. I thought to myself, is this all there is to life? Wealth and more wealth and then what? I want to try something new, which explains to us the celebrities and the wealthy people, why they go on drugs, why they try, go on pills like ecstasy and, and heroin, why they get drunk, because they want to get out of the reality of this world. He said, I got bored of this routine. So the shaitan played tricks in my mind. I said to myself, the only way I'm going to enjoy myself is to go out of this city to a place where no one's watching me, where my wife can't see me, my children can't see me, the sheikhs around me can't tell me off or, 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 or advise me. This is the shaitan telling you this, right? So I wanted to go and that's what the shaitan does. He doesn't tell you, go out, enjoy yourself and worship Allah. He says to you, why don't you go out and see the world in the world of tourism? Let down your hair a little bit. It doesn't matter if you do a few sins. They're only minor. When you come back, you pray and it'll wash it away. Don't worry. You are a religious person. You've lived for 20 or 30 years of your life, reciting the Quran, memorizing the Quran, praying your prayers, going to Hajj. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive you from a little bit of sin here or there. But you need to go out. That's the trick, where no one can see you. And that is when your true Iman is put to the test. When no one can see you except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What will you do then? What will you do then? Will you take off your hijab when no one else is seeing you because everybody else has got it off? Will you stop praying because no one else is seeing you and no one here is praying, no one cares anyway? Will you take for yourself a mistress? Or go with a boyfriend and girlfriend because everybody else has them and it's the norm over here. What's the big deal? No one is seeing me anymore. No one's going to reprimand me. That's what the shaitan does. Go out into the world of tourism and forget. Enjoy yourself. He said, so I came to this country that you and I are in. And I got to meet some people. We became friends. But friends of not iman. Not friends of piety. Not friends of advice. Friends of entertainment and fun. Because this is what I came for. But wallahi shaykh, I didn't come to do major sins. I didn't come to do many bad things. I'm married and I have children. And I believe in Allah. But I thought to myself the same thing. Do a few minor sins, it doesn't matter. Enjoy yourself and go back and Allah will wash your sins away. He says, but little did I know that these people whom I met, this was something very normal to them. They were doing it year after year, months after months. They used to be married and they'd come here and they'd sleep around. They'd fornicate, they'd commit adultery, they would drink and they would return and make a little bit of a tawaf and umrah and believe that all their sins are gone. Allahu Akbar. This is how the shaitan plays with us. As the Prophet ﷺ said in Sahih Bukhari and Muslim, he said, I saw, he said that the biggest reasons why people among my ummah will enter hellfire is muhaqqirat al dhunub when they look down upon sins. They look at minor sins and say they're nothing. So they accumulate until they turn into major sins. The young man says, I kept with these friends until finally, little did I know what they were drawing me into until I met one of the ladies who appealed to me so much. Day after day, week after week, I began to enjoy myself. And brothers and sisters, the shaitan doesn't come to you and brings the woman to your doorstep and says to you, fornicate with her. And brings the haram to your footstep and says, take the haram. He doesn't come and tell you, here, drink the alcohol. Here, go out and run away. Here, do this and here, do that. No, no, no. He takes you step by step, step by step. Allah says, do not follow the footsteps of the shaitan. 
He is a tricker. He is a trickery. He is a person of trickery. He says, suddenly, I just found myself with this woman. And then my iman began to drop and drop and drop. My temptations began to overcome me, as a man does. And then I was secluded alone with her. I don't know how, but it was full of laughter, full of jokes, full of entertainment that I thought to myself, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I'll be safe. I'll be safe until finally I was secluded with her and I found myself without even noticing committing the act of zina. I was committing adultery. And after I had committed adultery and finished what I had done, suddenly I felt like there was a pain and electricity run from my head down my, the back of my spine, a pain in my stomach. My senses came back to me and I felt a cold, freezing feeling. And then I began to scream. I remembered my Lord. I said, Ya Allah, Zanayt, Wali awwali marratin azni, Kayf antahaktu hadha al-jidar? I have committed adultery. It is the first time I do such an act. How could I have brought myself to this? What will I say to Allah when Allah says to me, Abdi Zanayt, my servant, you've committed zina. I will have to say, yes, my Lord, I did. And I used these legs which you created for me to go and do it. What will I say? He said, I began to burst into cries. And I burst out of the room, ran down the stairs. And at the door of the hotel was the leader of the pack who was walking with us. He happened to be a pimp who takes money for these things. At the door, he was drinking a bottle of alcohol, of wine. And he said to me, what is wrong with you? What is wrong with you? And I looked at him and said, I have committed adultery. Do you know what adultery means? I have committed adultery. What will I say to my Lord? And the man said to me, ah, oh, the matter is simple. Here, just take a bottle of this wine, get intoxicated and you'll forget all your worries. Allahu Akbar. Take a bottle of this wine and you will forget all your worries. And then he said, how can you do this to me? After you have prevented me from having a spouse in Jannah, now you want to prevent me from having the wine of Jannah. Because what you take from this world, if you die on a major sin, then you will not take this. It will be a cause for you to enter hellfire and you will be denied this drink or this woman for a while. Maybe even for eternity, Allahu A'lam. Only Allah knows. But this is what he said to him. Then the man said to him, the dirty man, the evil man. He resorted to religion now. He wanted to make himself feel better because he's a Muslim himself. He said to him, as a lot of Muslims think and say, Inna Allah ghafoorur rahim. Allah is most merciful, he'll forgive all sins. Inna Allah ghafoorur rahim. But he had forgotten that Allah is also shadid al iqab. He punishes severely. He has prepared for the evil criminals on the day of judgment. A fire with 70,000 rains. On every rain there are 70,000 angels. It has an inhalation and exhalation. When it sees the evil criminals, it begin, begins to scream out to say, Where are the criminals? Give me them. And the angels are holding it. 4,900,000,000 angels, huge in size, holding the reins of Jahannam. Why? Not to drag it. Not to drag it, but to pull it away and to hold it back like a mad beast. Allahu Akbar. The young man, Ahmed, he pushed the man aside and he ran out of the hotel. He said, for three days and three nights, I've been raving the streets, going around, running around, not knowing what to do. I wish they would have took, taken my money. I wish they would have taken my clothes. But instead, they took my iman and my dignity. How do I return back to my Lord? He said, the first place I could think of was this little prayer room in the airport. You see, the heart wants to come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that's his priority. The Shaykh says, I didn't know what to say to him. But all I could remember was the most hopeful ayah in the Quran, in Surah Az-Zumar. I said to him, Allah says, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ Say to my servants who have reproached who have regretted what they have done, who feel pain, who feel regret for what they have done, do not despair from the mercy of Allah. Allah forgives all sins. He is the greatest forgiver, most merciful. The young man Ahmed looked at the shaykh and he said, Allah will forgive everybody except for me. I do not deserve to be forgiven. He is not saying it out of kufr, but he is saying it out of this deep, deep pain which he is feeling. He's saying, I don't think I deserve to be forgiven. 
because of the grave sin I have done. Suddenly, the sound of the microphones were telling him that the, air, the, 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 air, the, the flight is about to leave. So the Shaykh says, I took his number and I said to him, Insha'Allah, we will meet back in Riyadh if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills it. The Shaykh says, I went onto the aeroplane and I was thinking, it doesn't matter, you know, he'll think about it for a week or two, like everyone else, and then slowly the pain will go away. He said, after three or four weeks, young Ahmad calls me and he says, I need to meet you immediately. I went to the masjid and there I saw him. When he saw me, he hugged me and then he shook my hand. He said, Akhi, Shaykh, I did not come to say hello, but I've come to say farewell. I asked him, where are you going? Khair, insha'Allah. He said, I have come to bid you farewell. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills it, we will meet again in Jannah. The Shaykh looked at him and he said, I didn't know what to say. I said, what are you talking about? What do you mean we'll meet in Jannah? What has come across your mind? He said, I want to give myself into the Saudi government. And you know, over there, they still practice the law of the death penalty upon someone who commits adultery if they give themselves in. The Shaykh says, I didn't know what to say. I looked at him and I said, Ya Akhi, you have a family, you have a wife, you have children. Keep this sin a secret between you and Allah. There is the forgiveness of Allah. Use another pathway. Our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi opened another pathway. But everything I said seemed to go in vain. The young man Ahmad said to me, my, I, I want to be saved from hellfire and my wife and my children and everyone who exists cannot save me from hellfire unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts me, accepts me and forgives me. The Shaykh says, I didn't know what else to do. So I grabbed hold on to him, so I don't let him go. And I said to him, listen, listen, just for the favor that I did for you, to keep in contact with you, I want you to do one favor back for me. He says, I will do anything for you except don't tell me not to go. I am going to give myself in. I've decided. The Shaykh says, it's something else. I, you and I must go to the greatest Shaykh that we know in Riyadh. And we will ask him about your situation. And if he says, give yourself in, I will go myself and I will give you in. Young Ahmed said to him, okay. But if the Shaykh says, you have to give me in, you have to obey. He says, fine. So they went to this noble Shaykh in Riyadh. And this Alim said, لا يسلم نفسه. Tell him not to give himself in. There is another way out. And this alim himself, he says, every night for the past four or five nights, this young man, Ahmad, kept calling me. And I would wake up in the middle of the night sometimes to answer his call. He'd annoy me, say to me, Ittaqillaha ya shaykh, fear Allah ya shaykh, wa ana ata'allaku bi raqabatika yawm al qiyamah. I will be held upon your neck on the day of judgment. And I will say, my Lord, I wanted to give myself in. But this Shaykh, he prevented me. And the Shaykh kept on saying, I did not give you this fatwa except out of pure knowledge and evidence. Finally, young Ahmad settled and accepted it. But that wasn't enough. He called our Shaykh and he says, I want to meet you again. The Shaykh came back to the masjid and he says, I want to farewell you a second time. I asked him, where are you going this time? He said, I want to go to Hajj. You see, this is what happens. You want to return back to Allah. I want to go to Hajj. I said to him, Subhanallah, let's go together. So the young Ahmad said, no. So I thought maybe he's got his own qafila, his own group that he wants to go with. So he went. He said, as we went to Hajj, I was looking for Ahmad everywhere, but I couldn't see him. But on the day when it was the, the Rajim, the stoning, I looked and I saw Ahmad. I called out to him, Ya Ahmad, Ya Ahmad, I'm here. Come, come. Ahmad looked at me and he ran away. I thought, Subhanallah. What changed his heart towards me? Have I done something wrong? He said, when we returned back to Riyadh, I met with him immediately. And I asked him, Ya Ahmed, what made you run away from me on the day in Hajj on Yom Al-Tashrit? He looked at me and he said, few things. He said, Kuntu mashghulan bil istighfar. I was too busy seeking Allah's forgiveness, Ya Akhi. Antum unasun athar. You are pure people. You don't need it as much as me. You don't need it as much as me. And then he would say, I used to look at all those hujjaj and I would think to myself, I think maybe because of all these pure souls and I'm the only evil one here, maybe Allah will forgive me because of all these pure people around me. And he would say sometimes I would look around me and I would think the opposite. Oh no, maybe because I am here among all these pure people, maybe this season Allah will not accept the hajj of anybody. This young Ahmad after that, memorized the whole Qur'an by heart. 
Then he began to fast one day on and one day off. One day on, one day off, like the fasting of Dawood alayhi salam. And all his actions and deeds were only to please Allah. He wasn't the same again. In the masjid all the time. Fulfilling his duties towards his family as much as he can. His trust towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'll cut the story short for the, for the time inshallah. The shaykh says, time passed. And one day, a very eminent scholar came from one of the neighboring cities of Saudi. And he came into Riyadh on a special visit. He was like one of the big muftis. After delivering his dars, I said to myself, Subhanallah, this is my opportunity to finally find a solution for young Ahmed. It had been years now, and he hasn't found a solution for himself. So I came up to this great mufti, and I asked him about the situation of my friend Ahmed. And the mufti said to me, an ayah, a simple verse in the Quran, which I thought to myself, Subhanallah, I've read the Quran so many times, and how could I have not stumbled upon this ayah or remembered it? It is the solution for it. In fact, it tells the story of Ahmed himself. He read, وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَدْعُونَ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخر In Surah Al-Furqan. وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَدْعُونَ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخر And those who do not make partners with Allah. وَلَا يَقْتُلُونَ النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ And those who do not kill another innocent soul. وَلَا يَزْنُونَ And those who do not commit fornication or adultery. وَمَنْ يَفْعَلْ ذَلِكَ يَلْقَ أَثَامًا But whoever does any of these three acts shall surely meet a, per a terrible sin. أثاما. <coughs> His punishment and his torture will be multiplied. And he will be placed in hellfire, humiliated. Except he who repents. And then follows it with renewing his faith. And then follows it with continuous good deeds. Then these types of people who repent, renew their faith and follow with continuous good deeds, Allah will transform all their sins of the past. He will make them into good deeds. And Allah is the most forgiving, most merciful. The Shaykh says, I couldn't wait to bring this news to my friend Ahmed. He said, I rushed to the common, the masjid which he often used to go to. He said, I opened the doors immediately. And there I found Ahmed where he usually sits, on the first step of the mimbar, reciting his Qur'an. I opened the door and I saw Ahmed. He looked up at me and I said to him, Ya Ahmed, I have come to you with the best news. Are you ready to hear it? He said, say it. He said, I couldn't wait to say it, so I didn't delay. He said, I began to recite the verses. He said, I melodiously recited it to him. I said, وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَدْعُونَ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخر وَلَا يَقْتُلُونَ النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ وَلَا يَزْنُونَ وَمَنْ يَفْعَلْ ذَلِكَ يَلْقَ أَثَامًا يُضَاعَفْ لَهُ الْعَذَابُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ وَيَخْلُدْ فِيهِ مُهَانًا He said, when I reached the part of the verse where it says, his Punishment will be multiplied and he will be placed into hellfire, humiliated. He said, I looked at his face and it was as if I had stabbed him with a dagger. So I continued immediately. I go, he said, when I finish this ayah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah will transform their sins into good deeds, and Allah is the most merciful, the greatest of forgivers. He said, I saw Ahmed jump up. He literally jumped, and he ran towards me, and he hugged me, and he began to kiss my forehead and my face, and his eyes were overwhelmed with tears, and he was saying the following words to me, Ya Shaykh, I have memorized the whole Qur'an. And I have read it day in, day out. I have finished it many, many times. And Wallahi Al-Azim, today it is as if I am reciting the Qur'an for the first time in my life. It is as if I am reciting the Qur'an for the first time in my life. Brothers and sisters, this is the miracle of the Qur'an. You can recite it a thousand times. And every time you recite it, something new occurs. New reaction occurs. A new faith is renewed. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahi Al-Azim. Young Ahmed was rejoicing that night. Suddenly it happened to be that the usual Imam of the Masjid was away and it was Maghrib time. So they put Ahmed to pray Imam. 
As he began with the first rak'ah, he recited al-Fatiha. After he finished al-Fatiha, he had to recite a surah. Which one did he choose? His mind could not think of anyone but this one. He recited, وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَدْعُونَ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخَرٌ But when he reached the part where it says, إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنْ Except he who repents and renews his faith. He began to cry. He tried to repeat the verses, but he couldn't. He couldn't. So he went to Ruku'ah, then he went to Sujood. Then in the second Raka'ah, he recited Al-Fatiha. And then he attempted a second time to try and recite this verse to finish it. But when he reached, إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنْ Except he who repents and renews their faith. He began to cry again. He tried to repeat the verses. And the people tried to help him, but he couldn't. He just couldn't out of happiness. So he read another surah and he went into Ruku'ah and into Sujood. You know, some people, they, they cry out of fear and some people, they cry out of happiness. Shaykh says, months passed. And there was a time I didn't hear from Ahmed for a while. Suddenly, one day, I received a phone call. On the other line was Ahmed's father. He said to me, please come to my house very quickly. I need to see you. I have something a trust to give you. He said, I went to his house for the first time, the huge palace. I knocked on the very expensive door of his father's house and the father opened the door. He says, as soon as the father saw me, he exploded into, into cries. He exploded into tears and he began to hug me and crying on my shoulders. I said, take it easy, old man. What is wrong? What is wrong? And he said to me, Ahmed, gives you his salams. Ahmed gives you his salams because he loves you. And he entrusted me to bring this message to you. Your brother Ahmed yesterday passed away. The Shaykh says, I didn't know what to do. Should I cry with his father or help him calm down? So I started to calm him down and held myself back. In those countries, when a person dies in the family, just before they bury the person, they wash him and shroud him, they take him past the house, the body, for the family to farewell them for one last time. So young Ahmed's body was in the house. The Shaykh says, I entered, and I went to the room where his body was laying. I came inside the room, and I uncovered his face. He says, and I quote, Kashaftu <laughs> wajhan. I revealed a face that was glittering with light, as if it was glittering with, with light. I revealed a face or uncovered a face that had left this world, but it looked like he was so happy and joyous, full of light and full of noor. I said, Subhanallah. This is a great sign. I made dua for him and covered his face. Then I sat with his father. I said to him, please explain what happened. The father said, yesterday we were all fasting in Ramadan. And we were praying in the masjid after we had broken our fast, you know, on a date or two. And we we're praying the Maghrib. Then I looked at my son and I said, son, please, tonight come and finish your iftar with us at my house. My son looked at me and for some reason he said to me, Father, can I stay in the masjid just for a little bit longer and I'll follow you? I feel happy. I feel like I just want to stay a little bit longer. I don't want to get out right yet, right now. Please, Father, give me permission. So the father said to him, Okay, son, but please don't stay too long. The father says, I went home. And as we're, we're waiting for Ahmed, we're just waiting. Something struck me in my chest, a negative feeling, a feeling I've never felt before. It didn't feel right. He had a little brother, probably about eight or nine years old. I said to him, please go to the masjid and see where your brother Ahmed is. My little son went, he said, and after only a very quick, quick few moments, the little boy came running back anxious and crying and saying the following words, Ya Abati, Ya Abati, Akhi Ahmed, Daddy, Daddy, Ahmed, my brother, 
He's not talking to me. He's not responding to me. I said, Subhanallah, what has happened? I raced to the masjid and there I found my son Ahmed reclining on his right side on the footsteps of the mimbar where he usually sits. I came close to him and I put his head on my lap. Subhanallah, Allahu A'lam, was he going through a heart attack? Was something happened to him? What happened to him? Allahu A'lam. But my son, he was gargling. Yeah, and he was dying. He would go unconscious and then come back. Go unconscious and come back in second yes, few seconds no. And he was trying to mumble something with his mouth. So I brought my ear close to his mouth and he was saying, give my salams to Shaykh so-and-so. My salams to Shaykh so-and-so. This is why, Ya Shaykh, I called you to come to my house. Because among his last words was that he wanted to give his greetings to you. The father says, and then suddenly, while he was in my arms, his voice changed completely. And from his mouth came a clear, beautiful, vibrant voice, so melodious, like I have never heard my son recite before. And from his mouth came out the following verses, I do not why. He said, وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَدْعُونَ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخَرَ وَلَا يَقْتُلُونَ النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهِ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ وَلَا يَزْنُونَ وَمَنْ يَفْعَلْ ذَلِكَ يَلْقَ أَثَامًا يُضَاعَفْ لَهُ الْعَذَابُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ وَيَخْلُدْ فِيهِ مُهَانًا إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا فَأُولَئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتٍ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا He said when he finished this ayah, his soul escaped from his body and he went back to the one who originated it. Young Ahmed had managed to complete the verses which he could not complete before. The father says to the Shaykh, Please tell me, after my son's journey, he changed. Do you know what happened to him? The Shaykh said, I had promised Ahmed not to tell his story in full. But since his father asked me, I just said to him the following. Your son lost a very dear friend of his. As in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, which is sahih. The best companion and the best friend of a person is his Iman. When they do a sin, the Iman leaves you. And when you, come, and when you stop the sin, the Iman comes back to you. And that is why you feel the regret. It is the Iman which makes you prioritize your hereafter. This Iman which, which fluctu fluctuates, goes and comes. But it is only kept in your hearts when you continue doing your compulsory acts which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made upon you. A brother the other day asked me and I end it with this. He says, brother, sometimes my iman falls. What do I do? Brothers and sisters, don't worry. This is the same question asked to Umar radiallahu anhu. He said, iman fluctuates. It rises and falls. I think only Imam Abu Hanifa disagreed with this view. But the others agreed. But nevertheless, they all agreed that when you feel that you are far away from Allah, then it means that your actions of goodness have decreased. And therefore, they all said, resort to forgiveness. Make istighfar, make istighfar, make istighfar. Because when the sins accumulate on the heart, it darkens it. And when you feel that your iman is high, like right now, for example, if your iman is high, Increase in good deeds. Go and pray a few marakaat. Go and donate something. Go and help your mother or father. Go and, and, and reconcile between you and someone. Make some dhikr. Read some Quran. Any piece of make dua. Any piece of good act. Go ahead and do it a lot. Because when your iman is high and you do good deeds, what happens? The next time your iman goes down, it won't go as low as before. It's like muscles. <laughs> or exercise. When you exercise them more, they go down a little bit, but then there's muscle memory. So it comes back. And so does Iman. Iman has muscle memory. My brothers and sisters in Islam, this cannot happen unless your priority is right. Our priority is the hereafter.
everything comes secondary. So my dear brothers and sisters, no matter what you do, remember, what is it that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most? And then do it. Whether you are in a business transaction, how will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with you in doing that business transaction? When you get married, what is the best way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala advises you to do your walima, to do your wedding, to look after your spouse, to raise your children and go ahead with that? When you go for a vacation, what is the best way that pleases Allah in fulfilling your vacation? When you earn money, what is the best way to earn it? And when you spend it, what is the best way to spend it? Your youth, enjoy it. But what is the best way to enjoy it? And what is the haram way to enjoy it? All these actions are halal for you. However, look at what pleases Allah in them and what displeases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in them. If you do so, continue what you are doing and enjoy life. But make your priority in all these actions Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you see a food, for example, you don't know if it's halal or haram, your priority kicks in. Is it your desire of eating that food that is better? Or is your desire to please Allah better? So you leave it, for example. A doubtful matter is in front of you. You don't know if it's halal or haram. Do you think it is safer to go ahead and do it on doubt or to leave it? It is better to leave it and to be safe because your priority is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And remember this, a little bit of good deeds that are righteous and correct are better than a lot of deeds that are mixed with doubt. A little bit of knowledge which you are firm about than a lot of knowledge which you are not, which you are not so firm about is better. This is how we live our life. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our actions of good deeds and to forgive our sins and to assist us in worshipping Him and to let us die a death in which He is pleased with to meet Him on the word of La ilaha illallah with a peaceful heart. هذا وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله.